Good to see you this morning. Good to be together on this first Sunday in the summertime. So this today is the continuation of the sermon series, God's Will. And this is the third message of the sermon series today. And today's topic is God's will for us to be holy. And my introduction goes like this, and I, maybe my projectionist can find that next slide. There we go. Um, a dartboard. Dartboards have circles around the edges, white circles, red circles, and then you get down to the bullseye, the center, the center, the bullseye. Some people like to be told challenging things with some fluff around the edges of the dartboard. Some people like to be told challenging things by just getting right to the point. Well, today, I'm going to get right to the point. I'm going to shoot straight, and we'll be aiming at the bullseye. Straight talk about an aspect of the will of God that we all need to pay attention to. My intent is to speak the truth in love. But let me also say this, if you have steel-toed shoes, you might want to put them on, if you know what I mean. Your toes might be stepped on today, but I love you in Christ. The first scripture passage that we're going to be looking at today is 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 3 through 8. And if you have your Bibles, would you please turn to that passage with me? going to be reading from the New Living Translation. It says, God's will is for you to be holy, so stay away from all sexual sin. Then each of you will control his own body and live in holiness and honor, not in lustful passion like the pagans who do not know God and his ways. Never harm or cheat a fellow believer in this matter by violating his wife. For the Lord avenges all such sins as we have solemnly warned you before. God has called us to live holy lives, not impure lives. Therefore, anyone who refuses to live by these rules is not disobeying human teaching, but is rejecting God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. So I want to take a look at that passage in more detail. But one reason the Apostle Paul exhorted the Thessalonians on this topic was that moral standards in the first century Roman world were pretty low. There were very few boundaries. Sexual purity was considered an unreasonable restriction. Paul, however, would would not compromise on God's clear and demanding standards. The warning was needed then. I believe the same warning and exhortation are also needed now. The standards in our culture are also very low. Do you agree with that? We Christians need the reminder We need to keep our standards high. So let me start off by saying this message is for all of us today. If you can hear the sound of my voice, this message is for you. It is not just for the adults. This message is also for the middle school students and the high school students. It is for all of us. None of us are immune. If you are a sixth grader through a 17-year-old, you may think that you can drift off and zone out during sermons. But please stay tuned in today. This is also for you. So one of the things that my mother said to me often as I grew up was, quote, Mothers have eyes on the back of their heads. 
I know what you are doing. I have mother's intuition. Did any of you ever hear anything like that growing up from your mothers? She was right, by the way. She always seemed to know when I did something wrong or sneaky. Today, you will see how this applies to us. But let's go through these verses in this passage I just read first. Look with me, please, at verse 3. It says, God's will is for you to be holy, so stay away from all sexual sin. God created our bodies and intended that they be holy temples of the Holy Spirit. To be holy is to be set apart for a special purpose. Our purpose is to glorify God in our bodies. God will give us a holy passion to serve and to glorify him. The sinful passions of our flesh are opposed to God. Our holy passion can be stronger than the impure passions that war for our attention. We were meant to be to serve and to glorify God. We were not meant to be slaves of sin or of impulsive passion. In verse 3, the King James Version uses the word fornication when it speaks of all sexual sin. And you may have read that translation before. The Greek word porneia means harlotry, prostitute, adultery, or sexual immorality. The New American Standard Bible in verse 3 uses the words sexual immorality for all sexual sin, which is the phrase used in the NLT. But you get the idea, whether we're talking about sexual sin or sexual immorality or harlotry or adultery, you get the idea. Look, let's look on at verses 4 and 5. They say, that he should control his own body and live in holiness and honor, not in lustful passion. The English Standard Version says that each one of you should know how to control his own body in holiness and honor. The King James Version says this, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. Now, maybe those words are words you're familiar with. But you and I need to control ourselves, our bodies, and our urges. We don't have to let our bodies, impulses, and physical desires push us around. Remember, as Christians, you and I belong to the Lord. When I, say, when I say that Jesus is Lord, it means that Jesus is in charge of my life. Amen? That means all of me belongs to Jesus. My body, what my brain is thinking about, what I say with my mouth, what I see with my eyes, what I do, my attitudes, and my personality, they all belong to Jesus. Jesus wants us to be like him. He wants us to make him the priority. If the worldly stars are your role models, then change your focus and focus on Jesus instead. Be like Jesus Cooperate with Jesus. Let Jesus make you and me more like him. Amen? Let's go on. Verse 6 says, Never harm or cheat a fellow believer in this matter by violating his wife. Brothers and sisters, adultery is strictly condemned in the Scripture. That is a serious sin. 
husbands and wives, we need to honor our marriage vows to our spouses. Amen? Are you there? We also need to honor the marriage vows of the other married couples in our church. We also need to honor the marriage vows of the married couples in our families. And we need to honor the marriage vows of married couples that we see every day. We need to main, maintain purity towards other marriages and married people. Let's go on. Verses 7 and 8. God has called us to live holy lives, not impure lives. Living a holy life pleases the Lord. It is the will of God to live a holy life. If we reject holiness, we are rejecting God, his will, and what he wants to do in and through us. So stay away from all sexual sin. Now if you respond to the above scripture passage and say or think some, that it doesn't really apply to me, you're incorrect. There are no loopholes. There are no loopholes here. It applies to all of us. If you are being sneaky and trying to hide or cover up some of your behavior or to pretend that you aren't doing certain things, then this message is for you. Earlier, I told you about how my mother said she knew what I was doing. She seemed to know when I did something sneaky, mean, or sinful. The result was I was disciplined for my bad behavior. And I think part of my mother's knowing came from me having a little brother who told her what I was doing. My little brother sometimes was a tattletale. And I got in trouble because he told my mother what I was doing. Anyhow, more on that another time. For the students today, if you're a student, I want you to listen to me. Watch out. Your parents probably know if you are up to something that you should not be doing. And you can't hide anything from God either. He knows even better than your parents what you're up to. He knows what you were thinking about, what you see with your eyes, who you are talking to, and the attitudes of your heart. He is far better at keeping track of you than my mother or your mother. Parents have a way of finding us out. God is even better at finding us out. I want to talk to you for a little bit about this, the smartphone. I want to talk to all of us a little bit about smartphones. All of us need to walk in sexual purity when we use our smartphones. Our tablets, our notebooks, our laptops, our desktops, our TVs, when we watch movies, or use any electronic device. Is there an amen in the house? God knows what you are doing on your smartphone. He knows the websites you are looking at. He knows the images you see with your eyes, the chat conversations that you have, and the apps that you use. He know, God knows that? Yes, he knows that. He knows if you compromise your standards and say things, look at things, or do things that are not pure. You may think that until you get caught, you can get away with looking at an impure picture, using a questionable app, 
having an inappropriate IM chat or watching a video that you shouldn't be watching. Don't wait to be caught. That could be quite embarrassing for you. All of us, all of us need to stay away from sexual sin. You may say, I rather like looking at that picture, watching this video, or flirting with this person of the opposite sex that I shouldn't be talking to. You may say, I know I shouldn't be doing it, but I really don't want to stop. It gives me an emotional lift. If that is you, you need to stop. That is a sinful attitude. We all need to stay away from sexual sin. Now here's a heads up to parents. I'm trying to be practical today. Heads up to parents of students who use a smartphone. Parents, set boundaries for your kids on the sites and the apps that they may and may not use. Monitor screen time. Kids do not need to be on their smartphones for hours. Know what your kids are doing. Send them outside to run around and play in the yard. Or, or give them a job to do. There's plenty of summer jobs to be done, aren't there? Parents, you are in charge of your kids. Don't let them get away with doing questionable things on a smartphone. If your kids do not follow your standards, then please take away their smartphones. Having a smartphone is, a, is not a right. So they might tell you that it's a right. Having a smartphone is a privilege. I was 40 years old before I had my first smartphone. Can anybody else relate to that? Do you remember using the pay phone on the corner to call your parents? We had to stop at 7-Eleven and put some quarters in the pay phone to call and let them know what we were up to. We didn't have smartphones. Anyhow, adults... You may say, I guess I'm off the hook because I don't have or use a smartphone and I barely use my computer. Sexual sin and sexual purity go beyond smartphones, computers, TVs, magazines, and books. Those of you who are married, are you guarding your heart so that you maintain purity when you are in social situations with someone of the opposite sex? Or have you be, been drawn into a romantic or emotional connection with someone of the opposite sex besides your spouse? This applies to men and women. Men, are we guarding our eyes and what we look at? who we look at, how long or how we look at who we are looking at. Do you understand what I'm saying? Women, do you guard your hearts from thinking about a man other than your husband in ways that are not healthy? All of us need to guard our thoughts and not linger on something that we, should not, that we should let go of. We all need to walk in sexual and emotional purity. This is God's will for us. Let me go a step further. If you are married and are involved in a romantic affair with another person outside of your marriage, that is sin. You need to repent today. You need to be faithful to your spouse. Let me go a step further. If you are a widow, a widower, a divorcee, or a single person, you need to walk 
in sexual purity. Let me go a step further. God intended sex for marriage. All sex outside of marriage is sin. And marriage is between a man and a woman. If you are involved in sex outside of your marriage, you need to stop, you need to repent, you need to confess your sins and walk in sexual purity. So you say, Carl, okay, lighten up. Why are you talking about all this? Why? Because you and I need to stay away from sexual sin. It's part of doing God's will. God wants us to think pure thoughts. He wants us to look at people with pure eyes. Guard your eyes. Guard your hearts. Guard your lives. Be on the alert. You and I are in a battle, and the devil would like for you and me to be casualties in that battle. He would like for us to be ineffective, distracted, and not useful for God. Okay, so let's look at two other passages of Scripture that talk about the will of God in your body. Would you, would you turn in your Bible, please, to Romans chapter 8, verse 29. And it says this, For God knew his people in advance, and he chose them to become like his son, so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. You see, the Holy Spirit wants to make us more like Jesus. Every day, he wants to mold and shape every part of our lives to be more like his life. The way we talk, the way we act, what we think about, how we conduct ourselves, what we let our minds dwell on. We need to cooperate with the Lord, and we need to surrender all of me, quote unquote, to him every day. When we do that, the Holy Spirit will gradually transform our lives. Now, would you turn with me, please, to Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. And it says this, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. You see, Paul doesn't just say, if you want to, or this is a suggestion, he pleads with us. That's what it says in verse 1. I, I plead with you. This is so important. We should not ignore this or say it doesn't apply to us. When we say we are a living sacrifice, quote unquote, to God, it means that we are urged to give all of ourselves to him for his work. You see, after the animals were sacrificed on the altar in the Old Testament, they were dead. You are alive, and you are alive in Christ. As a living sacrifice, give all of you to him. This is not a ritual. You're not a ritual sacrifice sitting on a dusty shelf somewhere. In Christ, you are alive. As a living sacrifice, 
Present your mind, your will, your emotions, your attitudes, and your body to him every day. Serve and obey the Lord in your body. Choose to be holy and set apart for the Lord's use. He will be pleased when you and I choose this. Romans 12 verse 2 says this, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn how to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. You see, God wants to transform our lives a little bit every day. He wants to see spiritual growth in our lives a little bit each day. That spiritual growth will please him. Let him have his way in your life. You may be expecting a longer sermon today, but that's, that's what you're getting today. And I'd like to ask the worship team if you would please come up. If you would like to talk to me about topics that I raised in my sermon, feel free to see me after the service. I'd be glad to talk to you. I realize that I touched several hot buttons today. I encourage all of us to respond as the Holy Spirit leads you to respond. You and I can respond where we're standing, where we're sitting. You can come up to the front and respond at the prayer area. If you would like prayer, uh, I will be available. Others will be available to pray with you. But the will of God for you and me is to stay away from all sexual sin. The will of God for you and me is to be holy, set apart, to live a pure life. The will of God is for you and me to be different from the worldly role models we are surrounded by, to be useful to the Lord and to be transformed by the Holy Spirit that we are, so that we're more like Jesus. Would you stand with me and let's pray together, please. Lord, we do thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. Thank you that your word is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. And Holy Spirit, I just ask that you would use your word today and use my words to touch hearts God, to touch and encourage, and you bring conviction where you need to bring. And Father, give us each grace in our lives to walk in a way that's holy and that's set apart for you. In your name we pray.